Now let me introduce Tessa Watkins. Um, Tessa is a professional web developer with nearly a decade of experience. They have a background in video game design, a passion for UX and human-centered interaction, um, human-computer interaction, and skills in front-end development with a touch of back-end. In their home life, Tessa is married, and together they have a toddler and two cats. Aside from spending time with family, Tessa relaxes with their hobbies of martial arts, painting, reading, and writing. Tessa's latest special interest is social justice, especially for disability, mental health, and people of color. Uh, they volunteer with a local grassroots organization called MORE, the Mount Lebanon Organization for Racial Equity. I'll stop sharing and allow you to focus your attention on Tessa, present Tessa, so that she can introduce past Tessa. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tessa, and my pronouns are they and them. I find giving uh, live presentations <laughs> incredibly difficult due to uh, some disabilities. Of course, my mom would call. <laughs> so the lovely people here are accommodating me by letting me show a pre-recorded presentation. Um, so please allow me to introduce you to past Tessa. Of course, I didn't even press the button. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Thank you, Present Tessa. Technology is awesome, isn't it? Present Tessa will be able to answer questions in chat while I talk your ears off. It's kind of a good cop, bad cop scenario, but with time travel. I want to get some weird disclaimers out of the way. Thank you, Present Tessa. Technology is awesome, isn't it? Present Tessa will be able to answer questions in chat while I talk your ears off. It's kind of a good cop, bad cop scenario, but with time travel. I want to get some weird disclaimers out of the way, and everyone is going to end with, because I'm autistic. You might see random pop culture audio or video clips. This is because I have echolalia, and it can be triggered by pretty much anything, including my own thoughts. So to help you experience it, I'm going to add them to this presentation because I'm autistic. And there's gonna be some jump cuts, sometimes in the middle of a sentence. I can speak flawlessly when I want to due to the magic of technology. I have deficits with the naming neurocognitive skill. So real-time conversations with me tend to upset and or annoy the neurotypical audience. For example, I struggle to record the 40 second promo video for this talk. I'm also, also. <laughs> for as much as I want to be authentically me, this isn't the time. The world at large does not yet accept autistic people, so I'm editing myself to be acceptable because I'm autistic. Finally, and this is probably the weirdest one, I call myself past Tessa because I am thought of as a completely separate entity than present or future Tessa. It's why I have special powers that present Tessa does not. For example, I don't feel embarrassment. Rejection-sensitive dysphoria won't affect me, but it might affect present Tessa, which is why I can give the presentation instead of them. This is due to dyschronometria. I lack a coherent sense of time, so I'm essentially completely disconnected from past and future versions of myself. Ah, there's that word connection. This year's theme is a connected world, and I think I'm a bit of an expert on connections. As I mentioned, I have a neurocognitive condition called autism spectrum disorder. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but first, I'm curious about who I'm talking to today, so I'm gonna launch a poll. The answers are anonymous, so I won't know who voted what, but do you know any autistic people? Are you at all familiar with autism? At any rate, autism doesn't affect my intelligence but it impacts various functions of my brain and nervous system. It presents differently in everyone because humans are weird and brains are complex. Scientists don't actually know a whole lot about autism. For perspective, the history of computers goes back over 200 years. The study of autism is about half that, so the information available is still in its infancy. Like all other areas of science, what we know now might change or be flat out wrong. We'll know more when we know more. For example, the Austrian pediatrician and eugenicist that Asperger's is named after characterized his subjects as autistic psychopaths, and Asperger's was only in the DSM for less than 20 years. It was added in 1994 and removed in 2013. 
So yeah, we're going to expect a lot of new information and a lot of changes as we learn about autism. By now you're probably thinking, what does autism have to do with information architecture? What does it have to do with connections? Why should I care? And I will answer all of those questions. The word autism has Greek roots stemming from the word autos, which means self, same, directed from within. Autistic kids were described as having a solitary nature, extreme self-focus. Leo Kanner, a psychiatrist and physician that famously worked with autistic kids, published a paper titled Autistic Disturbances and Effective Contact in 1943 that described a child as having no effective tie to people, that he behaved as if people as such did not matter or even exist. So in other words, to be autistic means you're not connected to other people, not like how humans are supposed to be. And the way we conduct ourselves can be unnerving to some. So it's pathologized, made into a disorder that needs to be fixed simply because it's perceived as wrong. But is it really wrong? If it is, then let's look at what's right. What's the opposite of autism? If we go back to the linguistic definition, let's look at other words that pull from the Greek word autos. We've got automatic, like a car's transmission that will change gears by itself. You don't need to manage the clutch. We've got autonomous, like those self-driving cars being developed right here in Pittsburgh. We've got autocomplete, like in text messages that will finish words and sentences for you. There's also automation, autopilot, autonetics. The obvious opposites of those words are things like manual, dependent, mindful. So if autism means self, then the opposite must mean other. In Greek, that word is allo. So while I'm autistic, someone who isn't would be called allistic. Allism is the perceived default neurotype for humans. We're pack animals. We're supposed to need and depend on each other for safety. Our babies are completely helpless at birth. Any deficits in communication among our species is pathologized. Seen as wrong. Meeting someone who doesn't have many social needs, we don't depend on your interaction for entertainment, for happiness. It's weird. <laughs> we are self. We can have amazing imaginations that entertain us for hours. The ability to hyper focus on things that interest us and the irritability that comes if it's interrupted. Autism is often treated like a disease because we don't need other people the way that we're supposed to need other people, and it marginalizes us within society. So that's what autism has to do with connections. But the other question is, what does it have to do with information architecture? Why is this talk lumped into a tech conference? In technology, our core identity isn't marginalized. It's celebrated. It's the goal. It's desired. We want to create these self-driving cars, reports that generate themselves, programs that run automatically, sensors that can detect things in our environment without needing a human. We want artificial intelligence because it's independent, autonomous, automated. If humans are mindful, then AI is autopilot. So naturally, autistic people like me are attracted to an industry in which we see ourselves as something desirable. I bet there are a lot of undiagnosed and unaware autistic people watching this presentation. And I'm here to say, you're not alone. That hopefully also answered your question of why you should care. You might be autistic. That weird coworker that doesn't make eye contact but really delivers, they might be autistic. I've been a professional in this industry for a decade. When I talked with others throughout my career about my autistic traits, I was often met with people nodding their heads, finding my experiences relatable. I'd describe things like how I organize my files meticulously, the naming conventions of my classes and functions. They'd chuckle and say, aren't we all a little autistic? Because more often than not, they also did these things. Okay, so let's find out if you're a little autistic too. You can use the buttons in Zoom to raise your hand, or not, uh, or put it in chat. I won't judge you. I actually can't because I'm pre-recorded. <laughs> so let's go. Raise your hand if you follow a naming convention for all of your projects. Could be folders, class names, function names, whatever. Not for just one project, but for all of them. Okay. Now keep your hand raised 
if you also have a strict routine somewhere not work related. Every morning after I wake up, I use the toilet, I weigh myself, I drink my shake, I take my meds with that shake, and then I get dressed. And it must happen in that order, else any deviation causes me extreme anxiety. And that kind of sets the tone for the day. It's mm, bad. Raise your hand if you write thorough documentation. If you like writing documentation, or reading or following a well-documented project brings you joy. Keep your hand raised if you also have documentation for daily household things. I can never remember how to make a coffee, use the washing machine, the air fryer, where clothes are stored in my closet, which knob controls which burner on the stove. I have documentation for life skills. Raise your hand if, when you realize that there's a prerequisite for a task, that you drop what you're doing to complete that prerequisite before you can resume your task. Even if it's just a nice to have feature in, not necessarily blocking. Now keep your hand raised if you can't wash a single dish until you've unloaded the dishwasher, emptied the drain rack, and approximately 10 hours later. Before you know it, you've walked all over the house and you're tired and you're like, Ugh, I'm just gonna take a break. And then your partner comes home and they're like, why is the dishwasher open and the dishes are still dirty? While planning this talk, I knew I wanted to pre-record this. I wanted to be able to write and have something that could act as an estimated speaking time. Did you know there isn't a word add-in for that? No biggie. I taught myself in an hour how to make one. <laughs> and then I did. I programmed a tool just so I could get started on this. Yeah. According to that tool, I should be about 10 minutes in. I even tested my own speaking time to calculate my average words per minute, which is like, 150-ish slower than the average person, which I knew. My point is that people can't be a little autistic. That's like saying my Google Pixel phone's a little bit iPhone-ish. Yeah, they can both make phone calls and take pictures and doom scroll on Facebook and TikTok, but on the inside, they're very, very different. They're both smartphones and we're all human. Being autistic is normal. It's not if you do X behavior, then you're autistic. Autism is the operating system. It's not a feature or a bug, but as we know, it's treated like a bug. In past employee reviews, I've had the following written about me by both supervisors and coworkers. I would like to see them a bit more pointed in their updates to the project managers. Tessa communicates well with internal and external clients. If anything, they may over-communicate. Tessa is too robotic in their reports. As you can see, I consistently come up short in the communication category, and I have a disability that affects my communication. So when employee reviews impact our annual merit scores, is it fair that I'm consistently dinged due to a disability? Is it covert systematic disability discrimination? I don't know, but I have tried in not appearing so disabled. That last bit of feedback about me being too robotic, well, I didn't know how to change my language to be less robotic, so you want to know what my solution was? <laughs> emojis! <laughs> I started adding emojis to my reports. I think it worked because nobody complained about it since. When I told my husband this, he laughed and said, that's exactly what a robot would do. Though, I would beg to differ. I'm not the robot. To me, your tone of voice, your subtle hints, they go right over my head. If anyone is a robot, it's everyone else. Because you all sound the same to me. It's why I take everything everyone else says so literally. It's also why everything I say is literal. I need explicit directions unless you intend to leave me with the creative freedom. I don't have a brilliant segue into my next talking point, so I'm just gonna autistically start talking about it and we're all gonna be cool with that. There's this phrase, autistic culture, and I think the meaning varies a bit from person to person, but here's what I think it means. Autistic culture is defined by experiences shared among the autistic population more than the autistic one. Autistic culture is not synonymous with signs of autism or its comorbidities, 
Are these experiences exclusive to autistic people? No. Can anyone experience them? Yeah. It's about the correlation of interests and lifestyles and challenges and more. It's not about figuring out what's caused by autism, but what do autistic people have in common? Because the STEM industries appeal to our autistic nature, you might say working in tech could be a part of autistic culture. Discovering these commonalities, these connections, and then info dumping to each other about our special interests we start creating autistic communities and shaping autistic culture. Early science said autistic people couldn't bond or connect with others. And yet, I founded a thriving little community of autistic people online. It's a small, private group, not quite 400 members yet. I started it in August 2020. This community is a subset of a larger one called One Bad Mother, which is run by listeners of the podcast of the same name. So there was already this support structure in place with some key rules that members are familiar with. One, don't be a jerk and don't assume someone is being a jerk. And two, don't give advice unless it's asked for. So in our little autistic corner, people stopped assuming our blunt responses were intentionally malicious. Being mistaken for rude when we're just being straightforward is autistic culture. It also taught me that sometimes people just talk to be heard. Not everyone talking to me expects me to fix their problems. Jumping straight to offering solutions to a problem after learning about it is autistic culture. <laughs> These kinds of rules are helping me and other autistic people not only connect with each other, but with autistic people because we've been given explicit rules for engagement. I've had numerous members post in this group saying how safe they feel with their vulnerable questions and experiences, and that really warms my heart. When people make mistakes, they aren't punished. They're called in. When someone is experiencing a panic attack or RSD, I can identify it because I've experienced it. And support and grace is given. It's a place where people can drop knowledge on their favorite things and find someone who is equally as invested. It's mostly geared toward autistic parents, but we have some holistic parents and educators in there too that are listening to us and learning from us so that they can better support autistic people in their lives. Because as I mentioned, the current information about autism is lacking. People seem to think that the global pandemic broke human connections and they may be right, but I think it's also normalized a method of connecting that is better suited for people like me. Sensory sensitivities are common in autistic people, and now that I work from home, I have full control over my environment. I no longer have to tolerate food smells in a shared kitchen that may trigger my ARFID. I no longer have to tolerate the sounds that would have triggered my fight or flight response. I no longer have to tolerate impromptu in-person meetings at the water cooler or people physically coming over to my desk and demanding my immediate attention, potentially triggering RSD or anxiety. I can use automatic live transcriptions for all of our meetings, so I'm no longer missing out on vital information due to my hearing loss and auditory processing disorder. If my nervous system is becoming overwhelmed, I can walk over to my bedroom and get my weighted blanket. If it's becoming underwhelmed, I can get up and spin and jump and flap and dance or sing. I can stim however I want, whenever I want, completely free of judgment from my coworkers. <sighs> I'm in my safe place when I work from home. I am overall happier and that makes me a more productive developer. It also means my body is more regulated by the end of the day. Previously, I'd be simply tolerating the stressors and holding in the impulses. By the time I'd get home, I'd be irritable and short with my family because I'd be a complete wreck because I couldn't take the time to take care of myself the way my autistic body needed me to. It would have appeared as unprofessional to do all of these things in the office because autism isn't widely accepted yet especially the acceptance of self-identified and undiagnosed autistic people. You've still got a long way to go. Thank you for listening. My name is Tessa and it's I had a uh...
a timer <laughs> to automatically transition the slide when the video was over, but because clicking around on my mouse made the video stop, <laughs> it just cut me off. Should I um, publish the poll now? <laughs> I, I, I didn't notice the time when I was supposed to publish the poll, I guess. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is that the end of your presentation? Should we begin the q and Okay, I'm going to turn on my camera. Thank you so much, Tessa. Let me turn on my camera so that I can thank you for that presentation and explain that we are going to um, invite Sylvia onto the panel and stop the recording so that we can um, allow people to ask their questions. Is it okay if we keep on recording? Because I know. Um, I mean, okay. My then we'll we'll do here. text questions then. Yeah, I can I can read those out. Okay. Uh, let me let me invite Sylvia. If anybody has questions, please use the Q and A. Um, you can also say nice things to Tessa and Sylvia in chat, and there is a poll for you all to participate in. Let's see my camera's over here. Tessa, that was so articulate and witty and insightful. I wish I could embody your superpowers. Unfortunately, only past Tessa has superpowers. <laughs> Present Tessa is still very much autistic. And you seem to have found a spectacular <laughs> solution. I mean, mm. uh, the 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 or any superhero's origin story is a bit, is maybe not really complete until they learn how to take advantage of their powers and, and you managed to do that thank you to both sylvia and tessa for sharing with us really oh i see tessa's mom oh yeah she was one that was trying to call at the beginning and i just declined <laughs> <laughs> do we have any questions Um, okay. Hi, Tessa, that was really great. I'm so glad to hear that working from home has been such a positive transformation for you. I love my weighted blanket too. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, right. So I'm gonna mark that to answer live. Uh, uh, so Sylvia, do you notice any kind of overlap um, in between the two about um, what you were presenting about managing and creating culture um, and um, what Tessa has presented? I mean, did anything ring true to you as um, similar um, solutions, I suppose? Um, yeah, I would say so. Uh, especially when we think about creating um, workplace cultures and really trying to, trying to understand the needs of people and was mentioning like sometimes uh, every person has uh, behaviors or attitudes or sometimes are very difficult to decipher and it's really important to to listen uh, and it's really important that leaders do that um, it comes down to that to be really empathetic um, and trying to, to to spot also the differences and to look at them be able to look at them under a different light I suppose uh, because you never know, um, and uh, Tessa gave us a, a, a great insight into what a different way of, of living is uh, and of looking at things and interacting with the world. And so I suppose, I suppose in the workplace, it, it really makes a difference to, to really be able to be inclusive uh, also of this, I suppose. Thank you. Tessa, I see that you've identified a question from Sean that you would like to answer. Would you like me to read it out? Um, sure. You, like read it? you can read. Um, so we have a question from Sean. Great presentation, very insightful content, great video. Hugely helpful on helpful on better understanding friends and family or coworkers who are autistic. My question is for Tessa. How do you broach the topic of someone being autistic? 
In other words, isn't it harmful to suggest someone that they might be autistic, especially the baby boomers among us who might have grown up during a time where it was a little taboo to be diagnosed? Um, let's see, so I think my first question is, who are you harming? Um, because if the, if the question is, are you harming the people that are already diagnosed as autistic? Um, Cause I know a common, sorry, my words are missing. <laughs> um, a common, um, a common something is, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna fill in something, um, is that people will often say, well, you're taking resources away. But unfortunately, the autistic resources that someone might need is controlled by the medical community. So undiagnosed autistics can't actually access those resources. So you're not taking anything away from diagnosed autistic people. Um, so these assets and resources that I think would actually benefit a lot more people, you know, they're, they're, they're gate kept, gate kept locked away. <laughs> Sorry, my words are messed up. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh gosh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> I don't think I breathed at all the entire minutes. Um, but so the, I would think the harm that would be, would be for the actual person that is trying to seek a diagnosis, that's going on that journey of trying to find out, am I or am I not autistic? And I once read, and I keep parroting this, is if you think you're autistic, stop, because you're not trying to trick yourself. Normal people don't try to trick themselves into thinking they're autistic. So you probably are, um, you're, or you're probably somewhere on that spectrum. So the real harm comes from trying to seek that diagnosis and you find out um, where you have these doctors that have different uh, backgrounds, they have different thoughts on what is classified as autism, um, because only in 2013 did all of those diagnoses actually fall into the ASD umbrella. So even if you would have been diagnosed with PDD NOS, some doctors are going to see that and like, well, I don't, I'm not going to actually follow the DSM and I'm not going to say that this is a diagnosis. So I'm not going to give you anything. In fact, I'll just write it off as anxiety, or I think it's just trauma because I can't verify that this was uh, happening your entire life. You know, I, I can only go with what I see right now, and I'm not going to 100% believe what you're telling me your experiences are. So I can get, um, and, and that's really harmful because then you go home thinking, wow, that doctor said I'm not autistic, but I relate to so many autistic people. I should just leave the groups. I'm, I feel like I'm taking up space or I'm appropriating autistic culture. And when it's an invisible identity that you would be appropriating, it just doesn't really make sense. I think, you know, if you, if you identify as autistic and you feel comfortable in these autistic spaces, take up that space, you're allowed to. We have a question that is specifically for Tessa, Hi. but I wanna first let Sylvia ask or answer it in, in for non-autistic um, context. And then Tessa can, can maybe say what might be different if the person is autistic. So the question is, um, working with somebody who's not communicating much at all and is a bit late on assignments. So this is, I assume, like a, a remote work situation and advice on how to get the, someone on your team to communicate more. And then Tessa could go after and say, now, if this is someone who you know to be autistic, and we can see perhaps if there if there is a difference. Does that sound fair? I hope I'm not asking an unfair question of you guys. So, yeah, so Sylvia, it is somebody's not communicating enough in your um, distributed or hybrid workplace. How do you get them to communicate more? Yeah, that's a great question. I suppose uh, that would be uh, a red flag. That maybe uh, the connections in the regions are not working properly uh, in a remote setting. Then maybe you you think um, it, it comes down to to go and, and listen and asking. And there's an awful lot of literature um, that kind of encourages leaders to, to kind of go and, and seek try to, to seek out what are the causes 
uh, what might be the causes for, just, just go there and just ask to your employees what's going on. It might be they've got private issues. Uh, they maybe they, want, they, they may not want to talk about them or maybe they, but at the same time, you're giving the impression that you care and, and, and they may, may, may we have to open up eventually uh, about, 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 about these issues. But it can also be something more related to work for example, like um, feeling that they are not up to the job or they can't do that or they don't know where to start from. And this is very common, um, but it's usually maybe a major red flag, especially for new hires, if you, if you, someone new in the team and you are in a hybrid or remote situation, if they're not communicating that much, you, you may see that they're kind of disconnecting or trying to create a niche for themselves and they're not like connected to the, the collective levels I was, so, I was talking about before, like um, not connected to, to the bigger purpose of the organization. So they, they might stay at the company uh, because they, like, may, they may like the job or they may like what they're doing. But the thing is that they're not connecting to the organization as a whole. And this is very dangerous because that means that at the end, they're not gonna, they're not gonna create that synergy and then maybe potentially leave uh, when another occasion arises. So that would be, yeah, I, I would say like try to address as soon as possible this situation or just try to, you know, pick on a little bit on, on people, just try to encourage them to participate in space. If you don't want to start right away to ask what's going on, but I would recommend asking that uh, at the point. Um, it's really important and it must be a leader, a team leader or like, a senior manager, just go and ask what, what's going on to, to the person. Yeah. Thank you very much. So Tessa, do you feel that the same approach works if you know the person to be autistic or that you would uh, suggest a different approach? So anytime someone asks the question, how do I get them to do anything? I, I always encourage you to reword it and say, what is the barrier or barriers that is preventing them from doing something? Um, and it looks like just from reading this, if they're having um, issues submitting complete assignments and they're not responding to the emails, I feel like there's a lot of mental anguish going on um, and it could be caused by personal things, professional things, it could be caused by a lot of stuff. So that is something that you're gonna want to talk to them about um, very gently at some point. But I think, for, for a relatable story, um, I also have an LLC on the side where I do web development for small businesses and startups. And I once had a client who just had wanted me to do a very small update. And I hadn't responded to them in like two months. It was to the point where they were sending me a text message saying, I'm worried about you. I, if, if I don't hear from you, I'm gonna have to call the cops to do a wellness check. Um, so of course I emailed them and I'm, or I messaged them back and I'm like, here's my husband's phone number because I'd rather you not call the police. That's a whole different thing. Um, but here's my husband's phone number and you can call him if you, if it ever gets to this point again. But the reason why it got to that point is just because I had so like every day I was stretched thin in my mind. I just like never got around to doing the thing that they had asked. And I was so embarrassed by it. And I didn't want to report to them saying, I'm sorry, I didn't do this because it would have been repetitive. It would have been every single day for two months straight saying, I'm unreliable, I'm an awful human being and this is feeding into my depression. And it's just, it makes it that much worse. And I didn't want to be that vulnerable with the client, especially because I'm supposed to be professional. I'm supposed to be responsible and reliable. and. I was just, I, I would rather be no contact and pretend like, oh, sorry, cat, pretend, <laughs> pretend that I, everything was okay, then, um, then let them know that. Um, so to essentially ask them uh, outright, you know, what's the problem? Why, why, do, why aren't you doing this? And why can't you do that? They're, they're going to shut down. They're not going to answer that question the way that you want them to. And they might just lie to your face saying, I will do it, I will do it. And that is a lie because they know deep down they're not gonna do it for another week because they have all this stuff going on. Um, so coming in saying, hey, 
I noticed this is happening. Um, what can I do to help? How can I help? Um, is there, and I know some people, especially like me, they, excuse you, that's a mixed signal. She bit me and then that. Um, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, now I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was distracting. I knew I should have okay. walked around. <laughs> we can move on. Do Hi, you want to move on? Tessa. Oh, Hi, this is Jen. Jen. Um, yeah, Tessa, I feel for you. I think we all we all do sometimes when we have something that we've delayed. Um, but bad news never gets better with time, does it? So it's just it's just about it and and reach out for help. I'm sorry, Jen, I don't know if your audio cut out or if that was the end of your uh, question. Uh, she was expressing to me earlier that she had some Wi-Fi issues, so I might have lost her audio there. Uh, we have a, um, we are at uh, 1245. Um, so um, let me stop the recording. And we can continue and, and I could turn on um, after the recording's done, we could turn, we, I could allow everybody to be on camera if you want to continue asking questions that way. <laughs> 